The year is 1976. The newly founded company Apple had just released their first product, the Apple One. The Apple One was sold as a motherboard, meant to be put together as a kit by computer enthusiasts at the time. The machine featured a MOS 6502 at 1 MHz, as well as 4 kilobytes of RAM, which could be expanded up to 48 kilobytes. Apple continued to use MOS CPUs in their Apple II lineup until they switched to using Western Design Center microprocessors. When the Macintosh line released with the original Mac in 1984, Apple began to use Motorola CPUs on all of their Macintosh models. During the early 90s, Apple had realized the limitations and dangers of its dependency on using one CPU vendor, Motorola, at a time when Motorola was falling behind on the delivery of the 68040 CPU. IBM approached Apple with the idea of working together to develop a family of single-chip microprocessors based on the power architecture. After the talks with the IBM began, Apple, being one of Motorola's largest customers, reached out to Motorola to join in the efforts of developing the power platform. This powerful trio became known as the AIM Alliance. At the time, Microsoft and Intel were unstoppable. Their machines dominated the market, making up the majority of new computers sold. Apple would not release a PowerPC-based Mac until March 14, 1994, with the release of the first generation of PowerPC-based Macs. The first gen comprised of the Macintosh 6100, 7100, and 8100. Macworld's review of the 6100 stated that, not only has Apple finally regained the performance lead it lost about 8 years ago when PCs appeared using Intel's 80386 CPU, but it has pushed far ahead. The world would have to wait until August 25th, 1995 for the first portable PowerPC Max, with the release of the PowerBook 5300 and PowerBook Duo 2300C. While the 5300 was ahead of its time, the 5300 model faced reliability and safety problems as the lithium-ion batteries used burst into flames in Apple tests. Apple was able to recover from the flaming 5300 issues in 1996 and 1997 by introducing three new PowerBooks, PowerBook 1400, the replacement of the 5300, intended to be the general purpose PowerBook, 2400, a slim and sleek sub-notebook to replace the Duo, and the luxury model 3400. The 1400 and 3400 were the first PowerBooks to include an internal CD drive. In late 1997, the PowerBook 3400 was adapted into the first ever PowerBook G3. The Power Mac line from 1994 to 1997 was made up of many different models with names featuring long strings of numbers, such as the Power Mac 4400, PM5200 75LC, 610 with its pizza box like design, and the PM9600 200. On November 10, 1997, Apple introduced the Power Mac G3, which actually included many variants before the classic colorful plastic tower we all love. Starting in 1997, Apple changed its product naming to include the generation of PowerPC CPU and the name of the form factor or key feature afterwards, with the all-in-one models eventually being spun off into the iMac line. Now let's take a look at the various Power Macintosh G3 models. Apple sold three beige versions of the Power Mac G3, including the horizontally oriented desktop model, a mini tower, and an all-in-one with a built-in screen. Additionally, there was a server model which was identical to the mini tower. The beige models received some internal upgrades throughout their lifespan, including increased clock speeds on the G3. In January of 1999, the world was introduced to the Power Mac G3 Blue and White, which replaced the beige mini tower model. It was also the first Macintosh to include the New World ROM and the last to feature an ADB port. The year prior, Apple had replaced the all in one model with the new iMac which would later become known as the iMac G3. The new iMac had a dramatically different design from the original all-in-one, and didn't look like anything Apple had ever made before. In total, there were 13 different colors of the iMac G3. This was also the first model not to include a floppy drive. Let's head back over to the portable scene and take a look at the new iBook line, which was released on July 21st, 1999. The original iBook G3, also known as the clamshell model, shared some similarities to its bigger brothers, the iMac and PowerMac G3. 
It had a unique shape unlike every other laptop on the market, and came in numerous colors. The iBook G3 would receive an update in 2001 with the dual USB Snow model. The Snow model went back to a more traditional laptop style. In October of 2003, the final iBook generation was released, the iBook G4. This was another white traditional style laptop from Apple, now utilizing the PowerPC G4 CPU. In 2001, the PowerBook got a redesign, and the result was the new Titanium PowerBook G4. This model had a 15.2-inch widescreen display perfect for watching widescreen movies. The industrial design of this machine was a look into the future of Apple's design language. In 2003, Apple launched the new versions of the PowerBook G4, the 17-inch, and my personal favorite Apple laptop, the 12-inch, which were now made of aluminum. Later in 2003, the 15-inch model would join its aluminum brothers, ditching the titanium body. Now let's quickly go over the iMac PowerPC lineup, then head back to the good old PowerMac. 2002, the most beautiful iMac ever produced was unveiled, the iMac G4. Now with the PowerPC G4 CPU and three screen sizes. There was a 15-inch model, a 17-inch model, and a 20-inch model. This iMac was very special as it ditched the CRT display of the G3 for a widescreen LCD. The display was on an adjustable hinge that could move the display, which was very easy to use. The internals were housed in a 10.6 inch half sphere under the display. Then in 2004, the iMac G5 came out, now featuring the internals behind the LCD display. It came in two screen sizes, 17 inches and 20 inches. It was now powered by the PowerPC G5. The PowerMac G4 originally came out in 1999 and shared the same case as the G3 which came before it. While it was innovative in the hardware, its design was getting a bit old. However, there is a much nicer looking model in the PowerMac G4 lineup, the PowerMac G4 Cube. This model came out in the year 2000 and was a small form factor version of the G4. The small 7x7x7-inch cube housed the internals which included the G4 CPU running at either 450 or 500 MHz, up to a 60GB hard drive, and up to an NVIDIA GeForce 2 MX. The machine is stunning and one of the best looking Macs of all time. It is very unique as it features a handle which allows the user to slide out the entire computer for upgrades and maintenance. Finally, we arrive at the PowerMac G5. Introducing the Power Mac G5, the world's fastest, most powerful personal computer. Released in 2003, it was the world's first 64-bit computer and the most powerful Mac ever. It went through three generations during its lifespan. At its best, the G5 was able to reach 2.7 GHz and support up to 16 GB of RAM. It offered up to two dual-core processors, but also came in a single processor setup, dual CPU single core setup, single CPU dual core setup, and a dual CPU dual core setup with four cores total. Some variants used water cooling, however there were issues which included leaking. On June 6, 2005, Steve Jobs announced the company's plan to switch to Intel CPUs. In 2006, Jobs unveiled the first two computers with Intel CPUs, the 15-inch MacBook Pro, which shares an almost identical case to the PowerBook G4, and the iMac Core Duo line. 
both of these machines utilized the Intel Core Duo chip. On August 7th, 2006, Apple announced the Mac Pro, replacing the Power Mac G5. Apple had just completed the transition to Intel. In 2007, the last version of Mac OS X, which was compatible with PowerPC Macs, was released, and by 2009, with the release of Snow Leopard, PowerPC could no longer run new versions of Apple's OS X. In 2011, Mac OS X Lion formally ended Apple's support of PowerPC-based software. Why did Apple leave PowerPC and move to Intel? Jobs stated that the primary motivation to move to Intel was their disappointment with the progress of IBM's development of PowerPC technology. Additionally, Jobs cited the performance per watt projections in the roadmap provided by Intel. Apple won better power management for their laptops, which was achieved by the switch to Intel. With Intel CPUs, Macs would now be able to run Windows through Boot Camp, use Java applications, Unix applications, and x86 applications. Apple's reasoning behind leaving IBM because of slow advancement is very similar to what many are speculating today, that Apple will soon ditch Intel for their own ARM-based CPUs. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed, please make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. 